Welcome back church. This is section four of our act study and uh, we are in this uh, this book now for the past what is it six weeks and we've been uh, learning as a church how Luke has been telling us about the early days of the church. He's been setting before us two major teaching points. It's about what Jesus is doing. Now Jesus has risen, he's ascended, he's been he's seated at the right hand of the Father, he's ruling, is he simply waiting to come back? That's the first point we're, we're learning about. The second thing is what it means to be the church. What is the church like? Now in this section, section four, we are going to see how these two teaching points come together. They really overlap clearly. Because when we talk about what Jesus is doing, no, he's not sitting, waiting to return. He is active. He is building his church. He's carrying on that work. And then when we turn to look at the second area of what it means to be the church, we're on point four, which is where we see how the church pursues the growth of the church. That is what it means to be the church. And so we see Jesus is about building the church. The church is to be about building the church. And how, that's how we can see these two areas come together. The texts for this section are found in chapters 13 through 14. We covered 15 last section. So we then pick it up towards the end of chapter 15 and carry your reading through to the end of 18. So chapters 13, 14, and then 16, 17, and 18. Now you can read a little bit towards the end of 15. I think it'll become clear. That helps us get started into chapter 16. Well, in this kickoff video, I intend to help us, um, particularly in the first week of this section, where we just gather as much information from the text, try and discover what it is the text is teaching, what the author is teaching us. And so in this kickoff video, I hope to, uh, to lay out these chapters as I have been doing to help us get going really in that, in that pursuit, in that discovery. Okay, well, here's the chart starting to get really full. I hope I don't run out of space. I hope it's clear to you. We get more and more details on here. So far, we've seen in the previous chapters, we ended here last week, uh, ministry predominantly out of Jerusalem. Things have got going, explosion of growth, challenges, but more growth, and then persecution has come and dispersed the, the church. And we go through a period of transition. And it's in this time that Antioch really becomes the new center. And so for now, the rest of the book, we're gonna see ministry happening out of Antioch. We head into these chapters for this section, we're gonna see expansion is what's happening. The chapters focus really on three missionary journeys. Paul and a group of his uh, companions head out. They usually head out into one Roman province. For example, in the first journey, they will focus on Asia Minor, the Roman province of Asia Minor. They will go Cyprus first, and they will go into a city, and their form is that they will preach the word, they will tell people about Jesus, and there will be a response. Either people will believe, or they will reject it, and then believers then assembled as a local church, part of that one universal church of Jesus, Paul leaves them there in place and he moves on to the next city and he will go again. He will preach, there will be a response, local church established and he will move on. And they will move down through the cities and the first journey they will get to Derby, and they will return. And then they will begin a second journey where they head into a new area, a new province of the Roman Empire. But they will cover also the the cities from the previous journey. They will strengthen the churches that are there. And so while there are many events in these uh, five chapters, we're gonna see the, the pattern of two things happening. Local churches are being established and existing churches are being strengthened. And it's all about the expansion of the church. A bit like a forest, I think maybe new trees are being seeded and planted, but then also those existing trees are growing in their strength, developing good roots. We're going to look just briefly now at the green column here. This is where we note down how these events teach us about how Jesus is uh, building his church. And although these events are all focused on the activity of Paul and his companions, you will see in the result, the reaction they get, Jesus's work. By the end of the first journey, you will have local churches all over Asia Minor. By the end of the second journey, Europeans are part of the church of Jesus, the eternal body of Christ. In Macedonia and Achaia, there are local churches. And in the third journey, it is Asia Minor where there are local churches established. Now, when you consider the vast array of different people who are affected 
Like we have, we have proconsuls, leaders, uh, rulers in the Roman system, but then you have slave girls, you have business women and jailers, you have synagogue leaders, you have elites in Athens, but then you have the simple townsfolk on the frontier in Derby. All these different people have come the same way to be part of this one organization, the church this one organism, the church. Somebody in the next chapter is gonna comment how the whole world has been turned upside down. Now this is not the work of Paul and his companions, regardless of how, how talented they were. This is Jesus building his church using the ministry of these guys. Finally, let's look at this red column. What we're seeing is the, the church pursuing that growth. And this is also, it's very clear to see. The list of churches that they go, the difficulties they face, and how unperturbed, how they're not deterred from this work is difficult to miss, but it's also very challenging. There's one example in the, in the focus passage for this section in Lystra, Paul is stoned. So he's left for day and dragged out of the city and then he gets up. I believe a, a miracle happens to sustain him, but then he goes back into the city and the next day he just continues on to the next city and continues on this, this pursuing the growth of the church undeterred. It's, it's, it's amazing. Now, lest we think that this is only for the, the elites or the extremes, the apostles, this is for the whole church. The whole church is to pursue the growth of the church. Paul and his team will only hit the cities, the main, area, the main points, uh, or at least that's recorded for us. They will then leave and they will leave it to the local churches to continue that pursuit of growth uh, in the local neighborhoods, in the surrounding countrysides, in the smaller towns. This pursuit of growth is what it is to be the church. We will mention a lot of cities that you may or may not know where they are. Certainly these Roman districts, Asia for example, is not what you and I think Asia is. I think it'll be good to see these things on the map and plot out the journeys. Okay, so I'm going to try and, and sketch out, trace out these three journeys on our map. This is the map of the eastern side of the Mediterranean. Here you have the Mediterranean. Here you have over here Jerusalem uh, and Israel modern day Turkey, modern day Greece. Hope that will get our bearings. Okay, Antioch is our setting for the beginning of chapter 14, chapter 13, sorry, and I'll take green. So here they begin and it's Paul and Barnabas are set apart for the first missionary journey and we'll do this in green. And so they head down to the Seleucia and take a boat to Salamaris and they move down through uh, Cyprus it's during this time that the proconsul believed. From Paphos, they will take a boat up to Perga. This would be the, uh, the region of Pamphylia. And for there, they will move up into Galatia up to Antioch of Presidia. Don't confuse this with the Antioch of Syria. There are two Antiochs. From here, Paul will preach, very, Jew uh, very Jewish congregation, but then the whole city will listen to him. and. Uh, there are many who believe and many Gentiles to have faith. So from there, they will head down to Iconium. Again, a great many will believe, the text says. And from there, through, through fear of stoning, they will head out to the areas of Lyst the cities of Lystra and Derby. These are more frontier towns. Lystra, uh, it mentions that there are disciples there after Paul's ministry. And then he will move on after his stoning to Derby, and it says there are many disciples through Paul's ministry there. And so from there he decides, Paul and Barnabas decide to move back through these towns, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and they will do some brief preaching in Perga. They will move back through this area of Asia Minor to strengthen these churches before they again head back to uh, Seleucia by boat and home base Antioch. And that's the first journey and it took them roughly, I think, about two years. All right, let's do our second journey then. This one's a little bit, uh, a little bit bigger. Again, we're starting in Antioch, we'll take blue. Paul and Barnabas have split. Barnabas heads down to Cyprus to continue the work there. But Paul heads up through Cilicia on, again, also covers these cities of Derby, Lystra, Iconium and Antioch strengthening the churches there. Now this is where actually Timothy will join him. He takes Silas with him and later Luke will join him on this journey. They strengthen the disciples there. Many more people are added to the churches it says. And so they try to head into 
Asia. Asia Minor is done, they're heading now into Asia, but they're prevented. And so Paul heads north up through Galatia and he attempts to head in to Bithynia again. No. So he heads west and ends up at Troas. And it's there they get this vision of them, I call it the Macedonian call. And so he heads across to Samothrace and then on up to Neapolis and lands in Philippi. And this is, we're into modern day Europe now, so this is the area of Macedonia. And it's here where Lydia is converted, you have the jailer converted, and even that, that slave girl is mentioned as well. And uh, it's from there they flee. They were persecuted by, from the Romans there, where before it was Jewish people that were persecuting them. They head from, Philipp uh, from Philippi down to Thessalonica. And here it says, a great many Jews also and leading women believe. So from there, they head over to Berea. Berea, and that's those noble Bereans that are well known, who check the scriptures and says that there were a great many who believed there too. From here, they head to the coast and take a boat down to Athens. Athens, Paul preaches at the Areopagus. There you even have some of those leading people believed, including a lady called Damaris, it mentions. From Athens, Paul heads to, to Corinth. Here he stayed longer, and it seems there was a bit of a revival. Even the leader of the synagogue believed. And so that ends more or less the, the second journey, because there he aims for home. He takes a brief stop near Ephesus without doing any real ministry there, probably along the coast, and they head down to Caesarea. He goes into Jerusalem for some offerings and to strengthen the churches there, and then back home. Okay, so that was the, the second journey, and we covered this other province of Macedonia and Ikea. Probably took about three years, this journey. Okay, so finally, in red, we will do the, we will do the third journey. Again, beginning from Antioch, it says Paul moved up through Phrygia and Galatia. That would mean he covered again the cities of Derbe, Lystra and Iconium and Antioch Presidia that uh, he administered to on the first journey. And this time they head into Asia. That means he covers um, Asia Minor in the first journey, Macedonia and Achaia and now Asia. And that's where the story we will take a pause because we come to the beginning of chapter 19. And so we will finish this third journey in the following section. Let me just briefly summarize the focus passage as I draw this kickoff video to an end. Our focus passage is our condensed study that really brings before us the teaching of what Jesus is doing and what his church is. You'll find it this week in chapter 14 from verses 8. To 23. The setting is in Lystra. It's at the end of Paul and Barnabas' first journey. It's a Roman colony, the city, and it's probably got very little Jewish influence, although they seem to be very excited about the Roman, the Roman and Greek gods. Luke gives us this insight into what happens, I believe, because as he often does, he shows us detail to show us what's really typical. He gives us these details to show what is typical for a church that, that cares about the growth of the church. What are the challenges they need to face. Now the text can be broken down into three areas. I have it up here. First of all, you see them encountering the pagans in verses 8 to 18 and the reaction that those pagans do. Then you'll see the, let's call it the attack of the Jews in verse 19. And then the finally four verses that just give us a sum up of what Paul and Barnabas did in their ministry. These three sections teach us really that there's two challenges that you need to face and three practices that you need to have if we as a church need to, are going to care about the growth of the church. And you can see that and what they had to deal with and how they responded in the city of Lystra. You will see, first of all, the challenge of ignorance and the challenge of hostility. Now, by ignorance, I mean the lack of kind of common understanding of God. This crowd, this crowd react and believe that Paul and Barnabas are God. And it just shows you the difference between their understanding of who God is and Jesus Christ. As so you can imagine teaching to a crowd who had no concept of one God, who was consistent, living, no understanding of what sin is, or substitution, or atonement, or any of those things. And this is what Paul and Barnabas had to deal with. How did they deal with it? Paul brought the teaching right back to this basic understanding of God as the creator and sustainer. 
one living God, not a statue greater than anything that, that they understood or could make themselves. Secondly, they had to face the challenge of hostility. This was religious hostility, actually. This was pretty zealous because these guys had pursued Paul and Barnabas for two cities now. And here they come and it ends up in Paul actually getting stoned. How did they face this challenge? Well, we can see that it didn't deter them. They sometimes ran away, but they went back into other cities and they continued preaching that same message that had drawn so much hostility. In fact, Paul went where he could to the Jews first. And so you can imagine him facing this threat of hostility every time he sought out, uh, sought out a synagogue to go and preach to them about Jesus being God. Well, if a church cares about the growth of the church, it needs to face these two challenges. And it's actually from these two groups where that growth is going to come. Jesus will save people out of their ignorance and out of their hostility. And that's crazy to think about. Now, finally, what are the two, what are the three, sorry, practices? As you see in the, four, the last four verses, what are the three practices that are necessary if a church is going to grow? And you can see them according to what Paul and Barnabas did as they return at the end of their first journey. You can see that initial evangelism is necessary. People will need to hear that information. They will not automatically have it. Now, Paul and Barnabas never teach the same thing in a sense, in the same way. Teaching in this chapter 14 is very different to the teaching in uh, chapter 13. Paul seeks to meet people where they're at, but then he will always take, seek to take them to the truth of Jesus and his gospel. They will need initial evangelism. They will also need follow-up teaching. Paul goes back through those cities, encouraging them to continue, the disciples, that they need to face trials and, and press on. Follow-up teaching is necessary. And finally, local elders to care for them. So Paul organizes the local churches, putting elders over every local church. And we can see that it's the necessity that believers are part of a local gathering with local leaders to care for them. I hope that gets you going. I've left so much information and teaching off the table. Have a great study this week. I hope you are, well, I hope you're shocked by the example of these guys, uh, but also excited because Jesus can work in a you know, in impossible circumstances, as we can see in these uh, in these verses. Bear in mind, as we dig into the text this week, we are trying to discover and understand everything that it has for us on this topic of how the church cares about the growth of the church, as does Jesus. But bear in mind, we're going to approach then next week how we respond. And we're going to be challenging ourselves and one another as to how really our lives are pursuing what Jesus is pursuing or not. Well, have a great week.